According to Professor John H. Walton of Wheaton College, he says the Old Testament does communicate to us and it was written for us and for all humankind, but it was not written to us. It was written to Israel. It is God's revelation of himself to Israel and secondarily through Israel to everyone else. As obvious as this is, we must be aware of the implications of that simple statement. Since it was written to Israel, it is in a language that most of us do not understand and therefore it requires translation. But the language is not the only aspect that needs to be translated. Language assumes a culture, operates in a culture, serves a culture, and is designed to communicate into the framework of a culture. Consequently, when we read a text written in another language and addressed to another culture, we must translate the culture as well as the language if we hope to understand the text fully. And I must say that I concur with John's statements here. The scriptures were written and intended to be understood from the perspective of an ancient Hebrew. This is why it's so hard for the vast majority of the population to understand even the basics of scripture, even though we have the complete Tanakh translated into our various languages. And additional to the Tanakh, we have the explanation of how to walk in the scriptures in the form of the gospels and the epistles. And this is called halacha, which is a Hebrew word that simply refers to the way we walk. The reason why most people can't understand the scriptures is because they use their modern westernized brain and attempt to make the Bible fit into their modern world view. And that's why most people think living by the culture of the Hebrews is irrelevant, even though the scriptures are actually the foundation of Hebraic or biblical culture. And that's why today you'll see that most so-called Bible believers have no problem with eating unclean foods. They don't care about the many prophecies or study the many prophecies throughout the scriptures. They don't take them seriously. They think it's fine to be homosexual, even though the scripture says it's an abomination. They think the man being the ruler of his wife and children is bad, is negative. They think polygyny is bad or is a sin. They think that when they die, they're going to float away to heaven. And the list goes on. You would have been hard pressed to find any ancient Hebrews who believed any of these things. The ancient Near Eastern and Hebraic worldview was completely disparate from the modern Western worldview. Furthermore, and as the Bible states here in Isaiah chapter 29, starting at verse 10, it says, For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I am not learned. And this is the case for the majority of the human population today. The scriptures are something that they can't understand because they are not learned or they are not properly taught they don't have the proper understanding as it says here in verse 10 the most high has poured out a spirit of deep sleep 
That's why when the scriptures say to observe the holy days in Leviticus chapter 23, they say, I can't comprehend that. I'm going to keep Christmas, which is a pagan holiday. That's why when the scriptures say that homosexuality is an abomination, they say, I don't comprehend that. Love is love. That's why when the scripture says the Sabbath day is the seventh day of the week, they say, I don't comprehend that. I'm going to keep the first day. And the list goes on. And how did the Most High pour out this spirit of deep sleep onto people? He didn't sprinkle any magic and make them hypnotized. He did it by allowing them to hear and be indoctrinated by false religion. And the religions of the world are the daughters of the Babylonian mystery religion. In the first century, during and after the life of Christ, and even more so in the second century, you had people who were perverting the truth by mixing it with idolatrous and pagan doctrines, creating gumbo religions. Here's just one example of what I'm referring to. John the Apostle, who wrote the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation, died around 100 AD. There was a man named Polycarp, who was the Bishop of Smyrna, which is now Izmir, Turkey, who was born in 69 AD and died about 155 AD. So he lived while John the Apostle was still alive. What you see on the screen is a writing from Arrhenius, who was a bishop in Lyon, which is in France, who lived while Polycarp was alive and saw Polycarp in person himself. Irenaeus says this, he says, but Polycarp also was not only instructed by apostles and conversed with many who had seen Christ, but was also by apostles in Asia, appointed bishop of the church in Smyrna, whom I also saw in my early youth, for he tarried on earth a very long time. So again, as we're reading here, Arrhenius saw Polycarp in his youth. It says, and when a very old man, gloriously and most nobly suffering martyrdom, departed this life, having always taught the things which he had learned from the apostles and which the church has handed down and which alone are true. So as I said, Polycarp learned personally from John the Apostle. Now there was a controversy during Polycarp's life about when the Passover and Last Supper, which is the bread and wine in commemoration of the death of Messiah, should be kept. Polycarp wanted to keep it, and he did keep it, on the 14th day of Abib, just like Christ and the Apostles and the rest of the Hebrews did because that's what the Torah says. It says to keep the Passover on the 14th day of Abib. But there were others who wanted to create a new doctrine and did create new doctrine and celebrated so-called Resurrection Sunday. And of course, a celebration of so-called Resurrection Sunday cannot be found anywhere in the Bible. Many modern churches today still celebrate so-called Resurrection Sunday and they blend it with Easter. So here is what Irenaeus wrote about Polycarp considering this matter. It says, for neither could Anicetus persuade Polycarp to forego the observance in his own way inasmuch as these things had been always so observed by John the, the disciple of our Lord and by other apostles with whom he had been conversant. In other words, what we just read is that Anicetus, who was a bishop of Rome that wanted to observe Resurrection Sunday, could not convince Polycarp 
to stop celebrating Passover or the Last Supper on the 14th day of Abib. It goes on to say, nor on the other hand, could Polycarp succeed in persuading Anicetus to keep the observance in his way, for he maintained that he was bound to adhere to the usage of the presbyters who preceded him. So Anicetus didn't want to listen to Polycarp and do it the way the Hebrews do it. As we just read, the second century Bishop of Rome, Anicetus, wanted to follow the new doctrine. But Polycarp said, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to do what I learned from John and the true disciples of Christ. Polycarp is saying, look, I don't know where you're getting this Resurrection Sunday slash Easter doctrine from, but John, the apostle of Christ, who walked and talked and ate with Christ, he didn't do that, so neither am I. This is why another man by the name of Polycrates, who was Bishop of Ephesus in the second century and who agreed with Polycarp, wrote this in his letter to Pope Victor I about this matter. It says, as for us, then, we scrupulously observe the exact day, neither adding nor taking away. And by the exact day, he is referring to the 14th day of Abib, when the Passover is supposed to be kept according to the law. It says, for in Asia, great luminaries have gone to their rest, who shall rise again in the day of the coming of the Lord, when he cometh with glory from heaven and shall raise again all the saints. I speak of Philip, one of the 12 apostles, who is laid to rest at Hierapolis and his two daughters who arrived at old age unmarried. His other daughter also who passed her life under the influence of the Holy Spirit and reposes at Ephesus. John, moreover, who reclined on the Lord's bosom and who became a priest wearing the meter and a witness and a teacher, he rests at Ephesus. Then there is Polycarp, both bishop and martyr at Smyrna. And then he goes on and he says, these all kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in accordance with the gospel without ever deviating from it, but keeping to the rule of the faith. So again, Polycrates, just like Polycarp, understood that the doctrine that many Roman church leaders were propagating about this Resurrection Sunday doctrine was a deviation from the scriptures. And so what proceeded to happen through the progress of time was that the so-called church became more and more diluted with foreign customs and doctrines until it was completely unrecognizable from what Christ and the apostles originally taught and was nothing less than a Roman extension of the Babylonian mystery religion. And there are a plethora of other examples of how Roman Christianity defected from the way of the scriptures. In 313 AD, the Roman emperor Constantine and Licinus who was the Eastern Augustus of the Roman Empire and who ended up being his brother-in-law, together they issued the Edict of Milan, which gave Christianity legal status within the Roman Empire. Constantine himself was a pagan who revered the sun. And the sun god's Greek name was Helios, and he has an Egyptian equivalent named Ra and his Babylonian Sumerian equivalent was Utu or Shamash. So therefore in 321 AD is when Constantine, the emperor of Rome issued his first Sunday law. 
which established Sunday as the day of rest instead of the Sabbath, which is the seventh day. As you see on the screen here, it states on the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in the cities rest and let all workshops be closed. Why is he calling it the venerable day of the sun? Because he venerates the sun. That's what he worships. And you will see this even today, whether it be in the United States or even other countries, that on the day of the sun is when people will close their businesses and when they where they won't work. It says in the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture may freely and lawfully continue their pursuits because it often happens that another day is not so suitable for grain sowing or for vine planting, lest by neglecting the proper moment for such operations, the bounty of heaven should be lost. In fact, the Council of Laodicea, which met in Phrygia Pacatiana, also called Laodicea Ad Lycum, which is in modern day Turkey in 363 AD, the heads of the Christian church met together to decide what would be the doctrine. And they agreed on what's said here in Canon 29. And this is what it says. It says Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day rather honoring the Lord's day. What is that referring to? That's saying that believers must not rest on the Sabbath, but must work on that day. So they're recognizing when the Sabbath is. They know it's the seventh day, but they say you must work on that day. And they say rather honoring the Lord's day. And what are they referring to? They're referring to the first day of the week, the day of the sun. That's what they're calling the Lord's day. It says, and if they can resting then as Christians, so you must rest on the day of the sun as Christians. It says, but if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. Anathema means to be rejected. So again, they're recognizing that the Sabbath day is the seventh day, but they refuse to let believers rest on that day, instead forcing them to rest on Sunday. And they're saying that if you do rest on the Sabbath, you are a Judaizer and you are rejected by Christ. And this is still the case today, which is why when you tell many people anything about the law of the Most High, they will tell you that it doesn't apply to them because it was for the Jews. Now, many have heard about the first council of Nicaea in 325 AD, which was called together by the Emperor Constantine, which, as I already explained, was a sun venerator. There were seven primary ecumenical councils, which were the first council of Nicaea, the first council of Constantinople, the first council of Ephesus, the council of Chalcedon, the second council of Constantinople, the third council of Constantinople, and the second council of Nicaea. In 380 AD, Theodosius, who at the time was the Eastern emperor of Rome, declared the Nicene doctrine to be the orthodox doctrine and that all others deserved punishment. And along with Gratian, who was the emperor of the West and Gratian's co-ruler, Valentinian II, he issued the Edict of Thessalonica, which made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. In 381, Theodosius issued nullis hereticus, which means no heretics, which is an edict dispelling non-Nicenes from worship in any town. So those who don't follow the Nicene uh, Roman Christian religion. He also held this same year the first council 
in Constantinople, which affirmed the Nicene Creed with minor variations. And here is a quote from the Creed. It says, the Holy Spirit, the Lord and life giver who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and Son is together worshipped and together glorified. So this affirms the Trinity, which is an unbiblical concept that we find in many renditions of the mystery religion. And I have an entire video on that subject. This is why in many churches you will see symbols of crosses, even though you can't find anywhere in scripture where people wore crosses or used them as an object of worship. This symbol was used in ancient times with various meanings and was a fertility symbol, as you can see here with this amulet that was found in the tomb of Amenhotep III. And what it represents is the male phallus, and you can see a close up here on the top and on the bottom, that oval shape design, or sometimes it may be a circle, represents the female womb. So you have the divine masculine and the divine feminine, which is why many people will tell you that it represents life. And this is representative of Isis and Osiris. Or in Babylon, it would be Nimrod and Semiramis. And many of you are already aware of this when it comes to the Ankh. And as you see here, this is a chain that dates to about the first century in what we now today call Sudan. And it is essentially the same symbol. You have the female womb and the on the bottom, you have the male phallus, you have the divine masculine and feminine, which is why you'll even see this symbol in various other places that aren't even related to the so-called church, whether it be pharmacies, whether it be here, you see the flag of Iceland, you see the cross on its side. Here are some flags of Scandinavia etc etc the american red cross whether it be the cross pate it makes no difference this is a pagan symbol that has origins from the mystery religion this is why the prominent freemason albert pike wrote the following in his morals and dogma he said, we constantly see the Tav and the Resh united, thus the symbol. And as you can see, it is essentially the same symbol. And for those who don't know, the Tav and the Resh are Hebrew letters. It says, this is the staff of Osiris also and his monogram and was adopted by the Christians as a sign on a metal of Constantius is this inscription in hoc signo victor eris which means in Latin in this sign you will be victorious so as he said here this is the staff of Osiris this is an ancient symbol which again is related to fertility or the portal so to speak into the world and we can see this sign different forms as you see here on this stained glass window of a church you see the all-seeing eye at the top which goes back to the eye of Ra or the eye of Osiris you also have the eye of Horus this is also a part of the ancient mystery religions and you have under that again the same symbol and of course, everything is within the circle, which is representative of the mundane egg or the female womb. This is why in Daniel chapter seven, it explains that there are four beasts, which are the major kingdoms, which will rule the world. The first beast was of course, ancient Babylon. 
which was the cradle for rebellion against the Most High. Rome is, of course, the fourth beast, which is the last beast and is the final extension of Babylon. And the Roman church and the Pope are the modern embodiment and representatives of the Babylonian mystery religion. This is why here in Revelation chapter 17, starting at verse three, it says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and 10 horns. So John is seeing this vision. He says, this woman is sitting upon a scarlet colored beast. And this beast is full of names of blasphemy. And it has seven heads and 10 horns. It says in verse four, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. So she's luxuriously arrayed. It says having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. It says, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So as we just read, this woman that is luxuriously arrayed is sitting on a beast that has seven heads and 10 horns. And on her forehead, it says mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots. What does harlots mean? It means whores. So she's the mother of whores and abominations of the earth. What is that referring to? All of the whores are the different various belief systems and religions of the world. And the reason why she's their mother is because they all descend from her. And why are they whores? They are whores because they are committing spiritual fornication. In other words, they're following belief systems that diverge from the way that is prescribed in the scriptures. That spiritual fornication. She is mystery Babylon the great. Why is she a mystery? Because you don't know what's going on. That's why people think that the cross symbol is a symbol for the most high or for Christ because they don't know what's going on. That's why they think that when they celebrate Easter, they're celebrating Christ and they're actually doing something righteous because they don't know what's happening. And the list goes on and on. That's why she's a mystery. And this beast, by the way, is the same beast that we read about in Daniel chapter seven and in Revelation 13. The beast is Rome. Again, as it says here in verse three, the beast has seven heads and 10 horns. It tells you in verse nine, it says, and here's the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. What are these seven mountains referring to? The seven mountains are what's known as the seven hills of Rome. And you see their depiction on the screen. Again, the woman is riding the beast and the beast is the same beast as the beast of Daniel chapter seven. It's also spoken about in Revelation 13. This beast is the fourth beast, which is Rome. What you see on the screen is a visual of the Abrahamic family house, which was authorized by people like Pope Francis and the Islamic Grand Imam of Al Azhar named Ahmed El Tayeb. This is an interfaith complex in Abu Dhabi that will contain a church, mosque, and a synagogue. And this is in preparation for 
who the Bible calls the man of sin, who will be the ruler of the one world religion and government. Christianity, Islam, and Judaism are all Babylonian mystery religions. And I look forward to doing an expose of Islam and Judaism and others. So the understanding of the Bible for the majority of people is not going to increase as time progresses, but it will indeed continue to deteriorate. For those who are of the elect, they will be forced to continue to move in an opposite direction from the rest of society as time progresses. Shalom.